So what this is trying to do is to have a flexible model which enables members who wish to work across constituencies in the way that the constituency committees did to continue to do that and to meet in public. So the difference is that that won't be a formally part of the executive arrangements of the council. But I think it, it also provides members with the ability to work together um, across wards within a constituency or across wards between constituencies. And, you know, um, I, I think that gives more flexibility than, than we currently have at the moment. There, there is no intention um, to get in the way of the arrangements that we're working with at the moment, but I think what it does is it puts local ward members at the, at the heart, if you like, of deciding how this, this funding is distributed going forward. We're putting extra money into the pot, 50,000 extra, um, and we're weighting it by deprivation and also um, uh, demographic uh, trends like age uh, as well. Um, and uh, Phil, I'll be, obviously I'll be, proposed, I'll be recommending that we vote against the, the amendment, but I don't believe that the concerns that Phil Gilchrist are, are set out in his amendments um, are, are, um, are well placed. I, I do believe that there will be there will be member support there, uh, so that there will be a member support team to support board members um, in coming up with these arrangements. Uh, but the, he um, also obviously raises concern about whether um, it's right that the officers have sign off. I think of, of spending proposals. I think the issue of that under our constitution, there is no delegation to individual board members. So we have to have a process put in place where we the proposals for board members are signed off. But I would call it a light touch process. So providing the criteria that are set out in the appendix around meeting the, the priorities within the world plan are um, adhered to the assumption was the presumption should be that uh, ward members' recommendations would be agreed. I think um, there is, uh, uh, in my view, an opportunity, every opportunity for, for members to coalesce around particular themes. So, you, you, Phil, you mentioned in your amendments about, uh, well, this will stop proposals around drop curbs. There's no reason at all why members can't coalesce together within a ward or across wards with a package of, of measures around improving highways and pedestrian safety for example. So my, my view is this model is worth trying. Um, we, we said we'll evaluate it uh, after, after a year. And we, the, the proposal is this will come in from the start of the new municipal year. Um, and, that, and what I would propose, um, if, if this would be helpful, I'm happy to propose this, is I, I would convene, happy to convene a sort of uh, time limit to the start and finish group of, of a small number of members across all parties to just ensure that the practical arrangements about how, how um, bids are put in, how proposals are generated, what the, you know, the, there's a form proposed that needs to be filled out, all that's agreed. So in time for the start of the school year, we've got something that everybody feels comfortable with. But I do believe this provides more flexibility than the, than the one size fits all constituency committee and I would commend this, uh, this model to the, uh, to the council. Thank you, Mr. The Mayor. Councillor Phil Gilchrist, to move your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I'm grateful for some of the comments made by the leader. I don't mean to be offensive, but forgive me. It rather sounds like Mrs. May trying to get things through over the last few days. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, the second problem I fear is those of us in Wheel South have generally rubbed along quite well. Uh, we generally agreed to pull money for certain things. The list, the leader says, well, we look at the list and we have this working party. But I'm afraid the list in the document is described as draft, but passing it through tonight makes it a bit too prescriptive for me. <coughs> the leader talks about a light touch. Well, I, I can understand that. I looked at Cheshire West scheme and I invite any members to look at the publicly displayed list war by war of how individual members spend their money. It's on their website. The leader also talked about drop curves. Well, it's a physical thing. And in the report, it says, <coughs> I don't want you as a member filling in, covering up for, I don't say those 
benefits, but essentially using your money to do things the council might or might not have otherwise done. We haven't got an indication of integrated transport budget money that might come down for us through the combined authority or whatever, and whether you say we might be able to meet as ward members across boundaries to talk about these things. We did in Wales South. We did actually fund, put all our money into a scheme in Plattridge Ward, where a lady waited for years to have a void. Uh, cars going through a garden fence every year and all the castle and the, the, the distress from that. I, I really would suggest the leader take, if he doesn't like my amendment, the council could always say, well, actually, we'd rather take the whole thing back and have another thing. So I've put my amendment forward and I'd invite members to judge it on its merits. Open up to debate, speakers. Councillor Christina Musfrant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, unfortunately, for the obvious reasons, I won't be um, supporting the amendment. But I would like to just say to everybody that it's been a pleasure to be a member of World South Constituency Committee because we have worked together, we have achieved an awful lot. We have to accept democracy that the other three constituencies didn't want to go down the route that we've gone down. We've had excellent staff, we've had, we've done so many things that I'm so worried are now in jeopardy. And we've talked tonight about services that could go under. I'm very concerned that the uh, service, the mental health uh, drop-in centre for young people will fall as a result. So really I'm standing up to say, all those of you in rural south, this does allow us to stay as we are, join together. We won't have the um, commu community reps with us, but we are able to call, as I understand it, meetings where we can decide to pool our resources. And I would like everybody to think about that um, if, if the amendment is lost. Thank you. Patrick Lewis, Mr. Mayor, I'm the county of UCI. I'm delighted things work so well in the world. And as much as I love playing the movie, I have to say, I think the policy for six and six has been an absolute nightmare, nightmare from day one. At like the last meeting, one, one person turned up in the public, a church hall, one person who turns up at every meeting, regardless of whether we turn up or not, he still turns up to a meeting. He's always got the same problem. He's not a resident of Wallace Ward, I'm delighted to say, but that is not a reason to have a committee of committee clerks, committee officers, 18 councils meeting, trying to agree something, and because of the split, the political split in the Wallace constituency, that's never going to happen. So the thought of individual councillors being able to get stuff done in Wallasey Ward or Morley Ward it fills us with delight, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Stuart Kelly. Just, uh, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Mayor, on, on the question of, um, of the decision-making process around the, uh, the funds, um, I mean, I hear what the leader says that, um, that the, move, the movement to individual uh, member budgets. Um, can't be prescribed, can't be delegated uh, in that way to those individual members. I understand that um, entirely. I think the mistake he's making is to, to put that power, if you like, uh, into the hands solely of an officer uh, with, uh, and I quote from his report, no right of appeal. Now, the last time we had micro budget setting was in the days of the, the, the early forums where two wards formed um, a unit. Uh, members of those two wards would get together and they would uh, decide the priorities and then allocate the funding to it. Now, the area, fund, the area forums also didn't enjoy delegation, but they made a series of recommendations which were then sent not to an officer to make the final executive decision, but to the cabinet member to make the final uh, executive decision. Now, I know this to be the case because it was made uh, for a period uh, that was signed off the decisions that have been made. Now, it's important, it comes back to this, what's the dispute resolution mechanism? Now, if you're putting in your system of no right of appeal, then the decision that wards are taking, either individually or collectively, is, it might touch or not, is going to be no, no right of appeal. At least in the old system, if one looks back to the old system, my decision, should I turn down and say there's no way I'm going to agree with what they wish to do with their money? That would have been an executive decision subject to calling. I would have had to defend that decision at a scrutiny committee, 
and uh, members would then have been able to make accounts of that recommendation back to the uh, uh, back to the uh, executive member and also to the cabinet. That I would suggest to the executive is how democratically we can still ensure that there is executive oversight and a route for challenge. It is not acceptable, I have to say to the leader, for him to say, yeah, we've got this light touch model, but whatever the officer decides, regardless of what the decision is, the priorities of the, uh, of the members, there will be no way to appeal. on Where does that fit? It's, it's just clearly not right. So I would ask, even if he's disinclined to review other aspects of the decision-making process, it will be what he gave at that aspect of the delegation. The way that we did it in the days of the air before, clear, transparent and democratic. And I don't see any reason why that can't be the case under these new arrangements. Ah, Councillor Jerry Williams. Yeah, just to uh, highlight the issue in relation to sorry, press on there. Uh, yeah, I mean we found the uh, situation in Wirral South really harmonious. I mean all the parties have worked oh, together in relation to funding funding areas. And it's been a positive experience going back over a period of time. And you might disagree with me, uh, Adam. I don't know, but uh, everyone else in the team has been thinking of being on this project. I think we've achieved a lot uh, over a period of time. So uh, I uh, just recommend that we go forward uh, as, as we have been. Uh, we've achieved quite a lot, and I think we can achieve more in the future. That's all parties working together. Thank you. Councillor Chris Blakely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, uh, give my congratulations to Councillor Shelley Jones and their the speech. Uh, I already did joke there before. Sorry, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> maybe losing thread now, Bernie. <laughs> like, like my colleague, Councillor Lewis, being a member of the Policy Constituency Committee, it was about you know, 18 councillors talking to themselves. Because I think you could count on one hand, the amount of times we got more than half of the people there, whenever we helped them, if we moved them around, it made no difference. There was one or two people who made every effort to attend, the rest of the time, and I'm sure the other 17 members of the Policy Constituent Committee will, will, will tell you that I've been advocating the money to be spent by ward from day one. I've never changed at every opportunity, I've made that view in the last meeting, I've made that view before I knew this was happening. So I, I am delighted that this is taking place now. I'd equally say to, to, um, to uh, Stuart uh, and to, to Phil that while I recognise what you're saying and I would hope you know, that we don't get to a situation where we have a policy officer, I would hope officers will adopt a common sense with approach. I would hope that things would evolve over a period of time uh, and we get a good working relationships. And as Phil said, those, those constituency committees who have come together as a committee want to stay together, but without that formal recognition, that's not a problem. Uh, but certainly from, from my point of view, from a, a uh, very parochial point of view, I'm delighted that the three councillors in Morton West and Southern Massey are being given the funding to, to spend on issues within Morton West and Southern Massey. It should have happened years ago, but sadly, 12 years. All Labour members would never support me unless you get Thank you, Mr. Any yeah. further speakers? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Chris Carradine, second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I find it work really sort of annoying, really, that, that we've been penalised in Wales South because yeah. that's how I feel. I'm losing my ass. Because in Wales South, we did work extremely well together. Um, when we look at the facts and the figures of how much we got returned for every pound spent in Wales South, we got between seven and nine pound eighty return. And it's been a very, very harmonious, I think the word was used over there, uh, way it worked. I think for all cross parties, I was chair of that committee last year, and we didn't have, I think we had an argument at all once in the entire year. Now, the, the second thing, the second point I want to make is everybody keeps telling me that nobody turns up for the public in the other meetings. Nobody knows about it. Is that a want to try advertise you? Is that a reflection of the way it's carried out in the other? Is that a down now? I want to hear the second. Though. 
I don't believe you can be shouted at as soon as you question me. Yeah, you want to
open electronic voting system. Members cast your votes. Has everyone voted? Close the vote.
had a conversation earlier, Councillor uh, Blakely, and assured him that his fears were uh, misplaced. That this was not uh, a movement of the deadline of 10 a.m. on Friday, uh, and that robust advice uh, is given in terms of the content of motions, but also keeping to the Council's deadlines. They're there for a reason and to be fair to all. On this occasion, uh, two things happen. Uh, one is that that draft amendment, uh, as submitted, was subject to advice for myself, which said it would be inappropriate and that would be my advice to the Mayor, because it says delete all, and that's a negation of a motion, not an amendment. Uh, however, I then had a further conversation with the Labour group and gave advice, and an altered motion was uh, amendment, something other was put forward. Uh, that came in and came into my inbox and I provided <coughs> evidence to Councillor Berkeley and others uh, that that came in good time before the 10 o'clock deadline. In fact, it came in on Thursday evening and I confirmed first thing Friday uh, at 8.35 that it was accept legally acceptable. However, due to a failure in our systems, uh, that was not picked up and was not published. So the wrong uh, amendment was published. Uh, this was not uh, a political move or manoeuvre, uh, it was a straight mistake on our part. Uh, for that reason, we have apologised to the members and uh, on the Mayor's uh, programme this evening will be to beg Council's indulgence and permit the correct amendment uh, to be put for you and uh, voted upon. That's the break. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. McCall, for that uh, explanation. However, it doesn't uh, take away my, or satisfy my fears. Uh, I still have fears that something serious has gone wrong here. The Deputy Monitoring Officer on Friday afternoon approved this amendment. The Deputy Monitoring Officer, who was acting as Head of Law in your absence on Friday, approved delete all and replace with. That to me, that's what was published, that's what stands. There should be no change to that. If it should be been an error, a clerical error, I'd say yeah, but we have to realise that a senior council officer has approved an amendment that says delete all and replace with. A senior council officer has approved that. Therefore, that's what was published. That's still not on the council's webpage now. Nothing's changed. This new amendment hasn't appeared on the website. Therefore, this amendment should be thrown in the bed. The other amendment disallowed, <coughs> and we should just move the motion to the amendment, Mr. Mayor. Anything else, anything else, will be a failure of this council. after the current debate. So, Councillor Joe Bird. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I am delighted to represent Bromborough Ward and all the people in it. I'm following in the footsteps of Councillor Warren Ward and I'm honoured to give my first real speech to Council for the many, not the few. The number one issue for my constituents is the huge gas explosion that devastated New Ferry in March last year. Children and adults are doubly devastated not only by the explosion itself, but also by the selective compassion shown by this government. Some families like Christopher Powers are facing their second Christmas in temporary accommodation. In the language of war, they have been called internally displaced refugees. And disasters can happen anywhere, at any time. When disaster struck in Salisbury, London and Belfast, the government chose to rip up their rule book and paid out quickly. £7.5 million pounds was given to Salisbury businesses for loss of trade, but not a single penny has come for traders in New Ferry. Why? Is it because, as Alison McGovern MP said, when it comes to helping people, you can never trust a Tory? <laughs> Prime Minister Theresa May, you know, the strong and stable one, and the Secretary of State, James Brokenshire, they're about as likely to win friends in the world as to win the next general election. 
and we say, bring it on. Because 20 months ago, in an instant, 39 people were badly injured, 68 people needed rehousing, shrapnel shot out 700 metres, damaging over 100 homes and shops, and 10 businesses closed instantly, losing 20 workers their jobs. The police called on around the crime scene lasted for weeks, and two criminal trials will start in January. If this happened in your community, you would be right to expect the government to help. <coughs> People on the road have responded brilliantly. We gave first aid, money, food, clothes and, and hugs. And everyone, every worker, did the best in unique and very difficult circumstances. Now the Rural Council is also making a good start on physical regeneration. The council will spend 1.3 million capital to buy derelict properties for new housing. And half a million is coming to improve the shopping precinct. But just as important as bricks and mortar is the rebuilding of lives and livelihoods from the rubble. A common experience for survivors like Ming Nicholson is that they received only a few hundred pounds for their emergency costs. Why was that? Given that the, the common practice in other places is for a flat rate, flat rate, not means tested, hardship payments would be paid out fairly quickly as standard. I'm very pleased that it is announced today that a hardship fund will be established to make payments to people directly affected by this disaster. And Wirral has repeatedly sent detailed letters to governments asking for help. The council has spent 560,000 dealing with this, this disaster and reclaimed 215,000 in chargebacks to insurance, landlords and residents. The Bellwind disaster scheme should reimburse Wirral Council, but this government will only consider that, it seems, after the council spends almost <laughs> half a million pounds. So there could be a gap of £183,000 for our council to make payments, to meet the government's threshold and to help heal the wounds and transform the lives of devastated people and traders. In conclusion, I would like to thank the inspiring community of New Ferry, Port Sunlight and Bromborough, who have patiently taught us so much about the injustice of their situation. We are on a long and painful journey together. The community is tenderly emerging, like a fragile butterfly from a chrysalis. And as a rural councillor, I would like to apologise to people directly affected. I'm sorry that some of the safety nets didn't hold you, and I'm, I'm sorry that it's taken so long to do right by you. Fellow councillors, please support this motion. Let's take action to find a way to make disaster payments of at least £183,000. And let's formally apply to the Valorant Disaster Scheme and insist that the government honour their promise to help. Please vote for this motion for both government and council support. And please support people directly affected by the new ferry explosion. support the spirit of this motion. Uh, I live very close to where the explosion took place, but I have to say that the council's response was exemplary. And every time I walked out my front door, I seem to see David Ball, he's not here, so I don't mind me saying that. On uh, bank holidays, on Sundays, he was there. Um, it did devastate a number of lives and continues to do so. And um, I am pleased that we have uh, agreed to look at putting uh, a fund, a ring fence fund aside for new ferry residents who continue to be impacted by this disaster. I think the Conservative government should be hanging their head in shame at their lack of response here. It seems to me because we're a Labour North Western Council, we just didn't get a look in. And that's in stark contrast to the responses, the quick responses that we've seen with Belfast and Salisbury to name but two. Uh, I'd just like to pay uh, tribute to the hard work of your predecessor Warren uh, and continued hard work of Joe Walsh and Irene Williams. You've all been absolute beacons of your community and you, you've, you've 
demonstrated how much heart and soul New Ferry has and will continue to have going forward. And I'm really, really happy to support this. Can I still go, Chris? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too remember walking through New Ferry with Warren Ward and David Ball a few days after the disaster. It's deciding that it takes so long to get some resolution to some of the issues and that some are still not solved. I did read the new cabinet report, Mr. Mayor, and I read the original report on New Ferry, which I think was about 50 pages, with various options about how to redevelop the area. I think it would be helpful if the members in charge of regeneration and housing and such issues could pull together a progress report on what's actually happening with the negotiations with the government, with the Homes and Community Agency, whatever it's that called, because I lose track of the name changes. I also lose track of the number of ministers of housing that we've had. <coughs> but it would be helpful to see if there's a strategy for the recovery of the community that isn't just contained in this motion but is helpful in setting out a programme of things the council might address on that behalf of that part of the borough in the coming years. Councillor Adam Sykes. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I begin by congratulating councillors Joe Bird and Sharon Jones on their maiden speeches. Uh, Mr Mayor, it is clear that the disaster faced by the New Ferry community has had a lasting impact on the people who call New Ferry home. The community of New Ferry has been due investment for a number of decades. Mr Mayor, I'm glad to see that the recommended action in this notice is a motion to apply for funding through the Belden Scheme, which we have raised before in previous notices of motion. Mr Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I'm also pleased to see the bid for the devolved funding from the Liverpool City Region as well to help the community of New Ferry. Mr Mayor, over the last two, year, two and a half years we've had a lot about left behind communities and the need to hear their voices. <coughs> Having sought assurances from government on numerous occasions on the route to obtain funding and in the light of the change of decision with respect to the Hinckley fire mentioned in the notice of motion, which has many similarities with New Ferry, in my opinion, council officers and local residents have complied with the ask to produce a regeneration plan and it is now time for the government to act for the people of New Ferry. Yeah. Councillor Ian Williams. Support this motion. It's very, it's very clear that people printing on some emotions are still raw. <coughs> Businesses have been lost, and um, I was, I was there at the beginning, and I, I saw, you know, when, when people was was so, it was so basic. The needs they were just like refugees. They had the out of their homes, couldn't go back to their homes and they had nothing. Um, we've moved on from that now and people have had 20 months of, of trying to cope and being devastated. And particularly people that have got businesses and probably most of their waking life they, they would be thinking about those businesses and now they're gone. But they're completely all that's left in some cases is the land and you know a lot of the houses are the residents and the businesses have just had to be demolished. So I wholeheartedly support this, this like, motion and I hope the, the disaster fund that's been set up, that this will um, this, this will help people of New Ferry to recover from this terrible disaster. And I also think that the government should help and they, sh they should support it. You've only got photographs of Belfast and New Ferry. New Ferry was like a bomb site to see that it's a much, a much more um, devastating <laughs> and they should, it's, not, it's not bad, they shouldn't have the funds. So I hope I'll support this motion. <laughs> no further speakers, go to the second of Councillor Joe Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. Congratulations to Sharon and Joe Baird on their first speech of that kind.
Mr. Mayor, the first uh, paragraph of this uh, motion states Council notes the impact it gets abroad in the new ferry is not gone. <coughs> not gone away. You know, some families are facing now the second Christmas temporary accommodation. Some businesses are shut up shop. Well, I was there on Saturday, we opened a uh, drop in centre on Saturday for people to apply to the local welfare assistance. And it's actually a business owner for the first time in 12 months she could bring herself to come to New Ferry. She was that traumatised by the uh, by the explosion. So the people, you know, people are still fearing the effects of, of the, the blast of New Ferry. I can remember, uh, I can remember well, three o'clock in the morning it was when I first got the uh, the notice of the blast. And I went up there at three o'clock in the morning. There was fire service and and all the rest there. There was the um, Salvation Army, I think it was. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but there was a you know a tea hut set up giving out whatever support he could. The residents were still traumatised, wandering around in the day state, most of them, and we ferried them down to the life centre uh, opposite Bedrington Station there. And back and all night we done that. And, and praise has to go to, I don't know whether it's been mentioned before, but council ex council Steve Niblock. Five o'clock in the morning we got the call at the exclusion zone when it got narrowed because we couldn't use the village hall because we were still inside the exclusion zone. But Steve Niblock was there at five o'clock in the morning, along with Marcus, who, who, who volunteered their time uh, making bacon sandwiches, cups of tea, all day till five o'clock in the morning that was. So, you know, this is a very bad thing. And, it, you know, it's only agree with everything that's been said, but this, this, this blast was unique. You know, we've never seen nothing like it. Sorry for the time. We've never seen nothing like it, and, and you know, I appreciate it still on the criminal investigation. But please support this motion. And um, two minutes is not a lot, three minutes is not a lot to say on the spot. Please support the motion. Um, and as you say, totally agree with everything to have said on the agenda. And this government needs to act now. It needs, you know, to wake up to this. We've seen similar disasters, we've seen Belfast being mentioned, we've seen Salisbury, you know, the governments that day are win, and they were there within the next couple of weeks and they helped it out. Why can't they help New Ferry? Get off the lands and help New Ferry. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bird has proposed the motion you have a right of reply to press the council for five minutes. Thank you very much. It's very heartening to see cross-party support for New Ferry and this motion. Um, the, there was a lot of, indeed, very professional support provided for the people of New Ferry and those affected by the disaster, particularly in the first couple of months afterwards. But my constituents are saying that after that they feel that they were left. They were left to fend for themselves, they were left to fight their own corners. Um, meanwhile, uh, the, um, the, the Houses and shops are left derelict, that, and some were actually demolished. And this kind of dereliction of New Ferry, it shows up large holes in our collective safety net. These holes have been ripped into by the Conservative government. The budgets to rural council have been super slashed. Families rely on a social security system that I think was designed by Ebenezer Scrooge himself. It seems to be designed not to pay out to people who need it. And workers generally suffer increasing insecurity low wages and zero hours contract. So our safety net is, is kind of ripped to shreds there. And it seems the government are playing a bureaucratic blame game. The government blames rural for not spending enough or not submitting the right paperwork. And it's like Scrooge finally deciding to help the, the Cratchit family, but only after they filled in the right paperwork and after they spent all their last pennies. This isn't good enough. The government needs to intervene.